Good evening and welcome to another edition, a conversation with John Canena on angles and attitudes. Tonight, our guest, I welcome Doug Feldman to the podcast, author Doug Feldman, author of 12 books nominated for the Casey Awards and the Seymour Medal from the Society of American Baseball Research and a former baseball scout for the Cincinnati Reds, Seattle Mariners, San Diego Padres. And currently, are you the professor at the University of Northern Kentucky? Is that correct, Doug? Correct. Yes. Thank you, John, for having me. Yeah. Good afternoon and uh, welcome, uh, Doug. This is truly a thrill for me to have you on our uh, just incredible some of the things that I've read about you. And of course, I purchased two of the 12 books that I will mention, of course, at the end. But um this evening, I would really like to go back to a book that I purchased. I think it was about 2006, which was a book about the 1969 uh, Chicago Cubs. Uh, the book, of course, entitled Miracle Collapse of the 1969 Cubs. And I have to tell you, that front cover, of course, is that September month. And the back of the book is the famous picture that was taken pretty close to the beginning of the year. And... Um, I always like to look at this first and then that second. Doug, what makes you um, write about that 69 season and Miracle Collapse? Well, John, uh, researching and writing about something is a great way to learn about something. Uh, yeah, I'm a teacher by trade and teaching something is a great way to learn something too. And uh, I uh, that was actually a year before before I was born. I was born in 1970, but I growing up, I heard so many stories about how it was such a great Cubs team, it was such a great summer until that very end. And um, uh, Don Kessinger became my, my first favorite player when I was a little kid in the 70s, and uh, he was gracious enough to write the foreword for the book. And um, I just wanted to learn more about what happened. And um, uh, one thing I try to do that I do within uh, most of my other books is, is set the story of the season within the context of uh, what's going on in society and the world. Of course, the late 60s, very tumultuous time in our society. And, um, you know, baseball players were uh, were not exempt <laughs> from that volatility. Uh, Ken Holtzman's uh, National Guard unit was on duty uh, at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Um, Don, Don Kessinger, again, Don told me that he, his guard unit, he had to go back to Cincinnati on his days off from the Cubs, uh, to do national guard training, uh, there or army guard training. So, or whatever branch of the service he was involved with. So, I mean, it touched the lives of the players as well. Things you want in society. Um, sure. I, um, uh, you know, in, in all ways too, I, this goes into the Cardinals a bit, but Jack Buck, the old Cardinals, uh, radio announcer once saw the Cardinals going through the airport in the late sixties or early seventies. He was walking behind them and he, and he saw players with, you know, holes in their jeans and they were carrying radios on their shoulders. And, oh, wow. You know, uh, tie dye t-shirts as they're walking through the airport and Jack Buck's thinking to himself, these are the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> so, you know, players were, <laughs> players were involved in, um, you know, the mainstream things going on in society at the time. So it was interesting. Sure. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you something because I did see a lot of it. Are, are you born and raised in Illinois, Illinois or are you from another state? I am. I, I'm from the northwest suburbs, Algonquin, Illinois, out by Schaumburg. And right. uh, so, you know, definitely grew up in Cubs territory. Uh, uh, kind of an interesting baseball mix in my background. Uh, my, my father played for the Cubs and the White Sox in the minor leagues, but oh, wow. he was raised in southern Illinois, which is, of course, Cardinals territory. So, yes. Um, Strangely enough, we've had a cardinal mix in our in our family for a long time, but um, but certainly uh, grew up, you know, watching the Cubs and the White Sox. Sure, and I, I see that in the books that you have written about, which we'll uh, I would like to uh, toward the end, we'll get into that. You've written a lot of things about the Cardinals, with, including the great Bob Gibson. We go back as far as Dizzy Dean in 1935, uh, Doug. Uh, to start this miracle collapse, which for me was probably, I have to tell you, the first year that I started watching baseball in 69, I was nine years old. And for some reason, that year left this lasting impression on this North Side guy who was born in Norwich, Illinois. You know, I remember just, I still can remember 
getting home just in time. And Barry Lursch and the Phillies came to town for the opener. And uh, they were down by one. And there was a man on. I think Huntley was on first. Then DeRocher called out Willie Smith to what Jack Prickhouse always said, lift the fuse to that 1969 season. I don't know if he's, uh, you're hearing me on that, Doug? Doug? Uh, you're, you're breaking up, John. I'm sorry. Oh. You're, you're, um... Okay, sorry. Yeah, I had said that Willie Smith pinch hit in that first game against Barry Lursch to open the right. season and lit the fuse in 1969 to that season. Uh, can you take us from there how, because you really depict a lot of things in the book. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, back, backing up a little bit, uh, you know, Leo DeRocher comes aboard in um, 1966 was his first season. And it, he wanted to find out, you know, if, if the Cubs were truly a second division team as they had been for 20 years or if uh, they had potential. And, of course, he found they had a lot of talent and potential. Um, and he lost 103 games his first year, uh, DeRocher did. So he's <laughs> – he came in with a famous saying the following season, I guess 67 would be back up the truck. He was going to back up the truck and get all the uh, dead weight out oh. and bring it, bring in people, bring people in. And uh, he didn't change things too terribly much. Of course, he had a great core to work with, um, but they even ascend briefly to first place a little bit in 1967, a place they hadn't been since 1945. So uh, DeRocher, you know, kind of quickly becomes a toast of the town. He, um, <laughs> there's one writer, I think it was Robert Marcus for the Tribune said, you know, Leo, he's 60 years old, but he, he looks 50 and he acts 40. You know, he, he was a you know, debonair on the town. Uh, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra were his personal friends. Um, right. Pool shark, you know, fabulous dresser, just real sociable guy. And uh, took to Chicago and Chicago took to him there as he was, um, you know, building Cubs back up into, into contention. Um, and as you well know, John, you know, the one hole for the team becomes the center field position there. They're solid yes. everywhere. Several uh, future Hall of Famers and and kind of like the 85 Bears, uh, other guys who probably could have been Hall of Famers, but there's too many Hall of Famers already. So exactly. not, not room, but, you know, solid, solid team. Uh, Adolfo Phillips was a very talented player whom um, Leo unfairly probably yes. <laughs> compared to Willie Mays, at least with his physical tools. And uh, Phillips uh, had a tremendous spring training in Scottsdale, sociable Scottsdale, as Ernie Banks called it. <laughs> uh, hit, hit 444 in spring training, and basically the center field job was his, but he broke his hand. So right. that left DeRocher with uh, scrambling to find an opening day center fielder, center fielder. which became um, there's a 19 year old guy named Oscar Gamble who would go on to better things in later years. But he's only 19 years old. Uh, Jimmy Qualls and Don Young, some kind of also rans that uh, they weren't counting on to play significant innings. So um, it was a, that was kind of a, you know, a anonymous uh, beginning there. But sure. Uh, because I mean, uh, Phillips was this Panamanian guy who, you know, I can imagine DeRocher getting in his face after coming back from a crack can. And of course, uh, the stories of Don Young and we'll, you know, probably get to that middle, that uh, ill-fated game in New York where, you know, uh, Mr. Santo kind of went off on Don. Uh, but yeah, uh, the center field position becomes a, a little bit of a situation because now, you know, do you take Hickman and put him in center? Do you take Spangler and go to right? Or even, you know, do you put a Willie Smith out there who that was backing up Ernie Banks from time to time when uh, Ernie was, of course, I know Ernie had some bad knees going into that 69 season, but um, just to speak a little bit about DeRocher, you know, here's a guy that of course had success in Brooklyn. He had success in uh, with the New York giants. And then of course he had his uh, troubles with baseball. Uh, they're probably thinking, like you said, in 66, when they get a Leo DeRocher, wow, we have this uh, managerial genius, but do you think, Doug, after in writing Miracle Collapse, do you think, because in years now that I've heard about this, did DeRocher, this question's early on, uh, were his better years behind him? Did he wear out that 
Sorry, John, you, you broke up on me again. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, did I, my question was, did DeRocher wear out that 69 team with the way he managed? Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I, I spoke with Don Kessinger at length about this, and um, he told me secondhand what other players said. You know, uh, Kessinger thinks that theory is overblown because, uh, for instance, he uh, – DeRocher started Randy Hundley. I think he caught 147 games in 1968 from beginning to end. I mean, from inning one to inning nine. That's right. a that's a big load for a catcher. But DeRocher said, you know, Hundley didn't want days off. And and Kessinger said, you know, they're in the pennant race there in August, September, and especially September, of course. And DeRocher had come to him and said, uh, hey, Don, do you want a day off? He's not going to say yes. He wants to keep playing. So, um could he have handled the, the pitching staff better? Perhaps, but um, um, another theory that comes into play, it doesn't have much to do with DeRocher, anything to do with DeRocher, but the fact Cubs are playing day games all, all the sure. time at home. Um, people have thought, well, you know, if they've been playing night games, it would have been so burned out. It's interesting that the, the club seems to be split on that issue. Um, Kessinger thinks the day games were an issue because he gets traded to the Cardinals in 1976 and, you know, playing home games at night for the first time, he sees he has much more energy. Um, sure. Ernie Banks, on the other hand, uh, thought it was an, an advantage to play day games because you had a normal work day. You almost had like a nine to five work day, like normal people. You go home to your family, exactly. dinner, get, a, get a good night's sleep. So it's interesting. The club is split on that. Um, um, <laughs> I, I don't buy so much into the theory that the Rocha wore them out, but, um, you know, just like any, you know, we, we scrutinize every manager's decisions in every pennant race. And um, perhaps, perhaps the staff could have been handled better. You know, the bullpen was a little thin yeah. starting staff, very, very strong, at least the first three, but uh, bullpen wasn't, wasn't great. And uh, maybe adjustments could have been made there, but. And again, quickly, he, um, you know, goes with Phil Regan, Phil Regan for his closer. I mean, he had Abernathy. He had Hank Aguirre. He had Rich Nye as a mm -hmm. fifth starter. He chose to go with Selma a little bit more than Nye that year. He had Colborn, uh, but she in those mm -hmm. months of August and September, he really laid into Phil Regan, where Phil Regan was facing lefties uh, uh, more than Aguirre was facing lefties. Doug? Uh, could you hear me on that uh, question? Say again, I'm sorry. No, I said that again. Phil Regan was facing more left-handers than um, uh, uh, Gary was there toward the end. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, he, I he think he had the confidence to be more in his bullpen. I yeah, think. I think something to keep in mind in that era, too, that's, that's when uh, if you were in the bullpen, uh, you weren't terribly good to start with, or at least that was the going theory. Right. Right. Um, your if your starting pitcher was expected to go, you know, as long as possible or or um, you know, complete game, usually expected. Uh, and we have uh, Hands and Holtzman and Jenkins. I mean, you're not going to run into a, a terribly long losing streak. You know, it's an old saying in baseball: if you have two aces, you know, you never yeah. have a long losing streak because how often are they those two of those guys going to be bad back to back? And maybe not call them aces, but you talk about those three. Um, um, Maybe the Rocher of the old school mentality didn't see a need for a deep bullpen. Now, guys like Rich Nye were thrust into kind of a difficult situation because he had to be a spot starter and a lefty arm out of the bullpen. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. <laughs> I felt that yet yeah, in that sense, Leo did lose like a confidence. Like he, he, he even brought in some older veteran pitchers like at the end. Uh, I don't think Nada Bart, Don Nada Bart, Ken Johnson didn't even see games toward the end. And if you look back at when they were, in, of course, uh, God rest their souls, they said in a lot of interviews that Leo basically, you know, the call would go down to the bullpen and it was, is Regan ready? Is Regan ready? You know, the vulture. Uh, so I just felt now when it was closing in on him a little bit and here now here we thought we had this manager that uh, maybe was going to bring them over the top and he didn't yeah yeah and just you know I'm, I'm speaking of a different era but i'm a whitey herzog disciple sure, <laughs> sure. herzog herzog said you know good closers shorten games and um 
he when he went after Bruce Suter from the Cubs, you know, he he had every intention of Suter being not just a one inning closer, but a two inning closer, because if, if you know the Cardinals and the Cubs in the late seventies, if they had a lead, you know, past the seventh, that game was over. And the Cubs of 69 didn't have that luxury. Sure. Ex exactly. Uh, in talking with you, I, you did probably a lot of research with Don Kessinger and talking with Don Kessinger, um, those first few months, like we started this conversation today with Willie Smith hitting that home run. The, I, was it that they went like 11 and one in the month of May? Uh, something to that. Or night. April. I think it was April. They went 11 and one. Right. They're up. They're up by seven games. I know at the end of May and then up by eight at the end of June. So things are, you know, cruising uh, very quickly right away. Fourth uh, of July, they knock out Bob Gibson in a game at Bush Stadium. Gibson hadn't been knocked out of a game. And I believe it's been two years. I believe he went from July of 67 when um, Roberto Clemente hit him with a line drive, broke his leg till July of fourth of 69 when the Cubs knocked him out without being removed in the middle of an inning. I mean, he had, he had been removed for a pinch hitter when the Cardinals were behind games like that, but that, that had been the first time in two years he'd been knocked out in the middle of an inning. So, I mean, the Cubs, um, Cubs are showing everybody through July. They, they were, they were a team to beat. This was, you know, this was really a lineup that, uh, I mean, again, like you, like we, we talk about their everyday lineup was Williams and left. You had this young Don Young who played the majority of the center field that year. And then of course you had Hickman and right Sano Kessinger, Beckert banks. And of course, Huntley who at times was spelled by Ken Rudolph, Gene Oliver and Bill Heath. Uh, Cause I remember when Holstman had the no hitter, I think one of them, one of the catchers, I think they might've used, three catchers that day because it was very hot. Um, and then when Holzman threw the no hitter against Atlanta and of course that pitching staff, when you go back to, you know, how you wrote the book, I loved every depiction, even up until the end, Doug, that you were able to, when I was reading this, I was really reliving every day of that summer. I mean, you had it down to that science you know, and here, you know, I know you're writing this book. Um, was it a lot of notes and you know, from the writers, from the, you know, like a Kessinger, sure. from a lot of the people, the Tribune, Marcus, Condon, uh, when you had to put this all together? Yeah, thank you, John, for, for a nice comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, secondary sources for sure, newspaper articles, primary sources, of course, Kessinger and interviewing players. But I think what's also key is um, you have to have, had baseball dirt on your body you have to have uh yes. you know felt the sun of a wrigley field afternoon um when I, when i wrote my biography of keith magnuson the blackhawks oh. player you know i would have i would have uh, I, I been missing something if i hadn't played some hockey myself as a kid and knew how it felt to you know slide on the ice after getting knocked down sure so, I mean, the, the sources are important um but anyone like yourself who is who has lived afternoons at wrigley you try to, um, at least I try to as a writer, put that feeling, um, those visceral feelings into the text because um, hopefully that's what grabs the reader and say, hey, I can relate to that. I remember, you know, um, the uh, the wooden spoons and the Borden, you know, chocolate chocolate ice cream you get in the cup there at Wrigley. <laughs> and um, um, I, I remember looking through the programs, you know, old Wrigley Field. And yeah, it was the Frosty, the Frosty. Frosty, yeah. right? And the yeah, yeah, Oscar, yeah. Oscar Mayer hot dogs and even cigarettes were for sale. You could look in the, the price list and cigarettes you could get from <laughs> yeah. your vendor. So, um, but no, so, I mean, those feelings just come back. And um, um, so that's what I try to do. I try to uh, relate those, uh, those feelings um, getting off top again, but the old, old Chicago stadium with the hockey and, oh. and, 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 you know, the dark, the dark corners of Chicago stadium where a, a 10 year old could probably get lost if he doesn't get back to his seat right away. <laughs> yeah. um, just uh, good memories for me. And I want to, not just share them with other people, but hopefully, you know, invoke them in other people's minds too, who remember. And you do that so well. Um, I have to tell you, going back to Miracle Collapse, when you talk to these writers, uh, let's say the Condon, the Marcuses and all that, do they feel that that, you know, here's how I've looked at it now as this adult, you know, in the 60s, I look at it now and I say, hmm, so we had Cleon Jones in left. We had Tommy Agee in center. We had Ron Swoboda and Art Shamsky, Bud Harrelson, 
Kenny Boswell, you know, and of course, Don Clendenin, and of course, Kuzman, Seaver, Gary Gentry, and Jim McAndrew. Were the New York Mets basically, well, we know they were, but on paper, it looked like at the start of the 69 season, the Cubs were the better team. But now when you look back, you're like, hmm. Some being greater than the parts, you know. Uh, um, yeah, the Mets, they went 38 and 11 the last six weeks of the season. And that's that's almost 800 ball. And uh, <laughs> that happens regardless of who the nine are you're putting on the field. Uh, that, you know, that only happens if, if, a, if a collection is gelling together and uh, not that the Cubs weren't, but you know, things, you know, snowball for them. They, they spiraled out of control. I think uh, the Cardinals uh, coming off two pennants, uh, they had uh, lost a significant star. Um, um, forgot who left the Cardinals after 68, but the you know, Cardinals. Uh, Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood. Well, Flood, of course. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and uh, Veda Veda Pinson came in, and then um, uh, Dick Allen would come in for another year, for a year, and, sure. and, Joe, and Joe Torre would come in. So Cardinals were looking for pieces to get that 67, 68 team back together. But no, um, it, it's, it's a great point. You That's true team gelling when, <laughs> you know, you got a roster, like you said, and an outstanding pitching, of course, but a roster like that, uh, you know, playing 800 ball for almost two months, that's, wow. um, you know, Gil Hodge is obviously great baseball man yes. knew what he was doing and you know and to think uh, uh doug and i i can remember this vividly i thought the high water mark of that 69 team was holstman's no hitter i think it was on august no 18th and i'm like okay they got this and their lead had see you know surged to an eight and a half game lead after he threw that no hitter in wrigley field and you think, wow, the confidence now is brewing. Sure, and sure. And at, I believe that at that point, they were 77 and 45, if I'm not mistaken. So you know, yeah. 32 games over 500, uh, but the Mets just aren't going away. And, um, you know, maybe complacency set in. Um, uh, but I believe it's when September comes around, September 3rd to September 12th is the big the big downfall. Um the, the cover, uh, the the picture from the cover of the book with um, the black cat, with the black cat, that's September 9th. And that's in the middle of that. that Doug, if you could give me one second, I just want to just grab something real quick. One second. Sure. Yeah, that book and the Miracle Collapse book, there is the Black Cat. And, uh, you know, the uh, lore of that was that uh, the cat was there to watch the mice underneath a <laughs> stadium. But, of course, the Cubs weren't buying that because Santa was on deck in your picture in the Miracle Collapse yeah. book. And they said that the Mets had put it there. But, Doug, to tell you this, there were a lot of sideshows going on, meaning... Uh, a lot of the writers, and I think you depicted in the book, I felt like DeRocher wasn't even managing anymore. He even got married that summer to the famous Lynn Goldblatt mm -hmm. from the Goldblatt stores. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on that, which you depict in the book? He, um, uh, Leo didn't digress from his strange behavior, you know, that's, that, that followed him before. Um, you know, he, I believe it was July 26th, he... Uh, secretly you know he left a game in about the first inning a nationally televised game like nbc game of the week put pete reeser in charge and uh flew up from old migs field to uh camp ojibwa in wisconsin rhinelander wisconsin to be at some camp graduation of i believe it was lynn goldblatt his his bride to be his yes lynn fourth, goldblatt third third or fourth bride to be yeah so, right um and then, and then that got out there there was a writer uh uh, Jim Enright, I believe his name is for a local Chicago uh, paper or magazine, didn't get along with Leo and someone, a friend of Enright's fed him that story that Leo took off on a plane for Wisconsin in the middle of a nationally televised Cubs game. So, you know, that didn't serve him well. Um, a friend warned Leo uh, of when, when Leo yelled at uh, 
Don Young uh, relentlessly after those two drop fly balls. And uh, a friend of Leo's warned him that late that night, you know, a Sun Times headline was coming out the next day um, talking about that thing. I, I, you know, I think he he did some things that were just Leo that, um, um, you know, didn't serve him well, maybe didn't serve the Cubs well, but uh, insurmountable, who knows? I mean, uh, the other things may have come into play, but it probably played a factor. Sure. Oh, sure. And here, I think, and we're, I, I, and I don't want to bring up this year that's what's going on on the south side of Chicago, if you do follow, uh, but I have a feeling, uh, you know, because this team was predicted on the south side to do well, and I just feel that these players, and going back now to talk about DeRocher, these players are not connecting to Tony La Russa here on the south side anymore, because his, that was a different era, that's just my opinion, but I just feel like even then, I mean, that was the style get in your face when Leo was managing, but you really brought it out in the book of the day to day where you could just see it that, um, and I guess I use the word worn out, maybe they just couldn't tolerate and he couldn't find the way to, you know, believe that they could win even with an eight and a half game lead on August 19th. Yeah, that, I mean, that the early September is so telling of all that you just say, John, uh, uh, just a gradual boiling over of emotions, you know, having some to do with the Rocher, not all. Um, th that eight game losing streak they had from the third to the 12th of September, um, the night before the Black Cat game, September 8th, um, Tommy Agee scores a winning run on a sacrifice fly and Hunley's Randy Hunley's certain he tagged him out in time and and if there, there's there's an old video of that. I can never find it. Uh, I, I saw a clip of it and I could never find it again. But Hunley's jumping up and down. He's you know he's snapping his head, you know, trying to control himself and arguing with the umpire. But, you know, that that's, you know, I hate to cite this, but, you know, the, the Bartman incident, you know, when one, oh. one thing, when one, one thing kind of, you know, clicks in a team, uh, you know, bad things tend to happen. Now I'll, I'll go back to the Cardinals, the 1985 Cardinals. And, um, uh, the the Don Denkinger incident at first base, you know, sure. you can blame Don Denkinger, but the Cardinals kind of folded right after that. You know, Jack, Jack Clark drops a foul ball by the dugout, a um, couple errors involved. So it's, it's <laughs> momentum and things like that are hard to, they're, they're intangible things, of course, but they tend, they tend to spiral. And um, then the black cat gets on the field the next night and Seaver beats him seven to one. Um, now, you mentioned getting worn out and I mentioned it earlier. I will say, uh, I mentioned Don Kessinger thought the day games had an impact playing all the day games uh, at home. He told me his weight went from 175 at the beginning oh, wow. of the season to 155 by uh, early September. He had lost 20 pounds playing every day, but didn't want to take off. If, if Leo had asked him, wanted a day off, he, he wouldn't have taken yeah. one. So. I had done a podcast uh, with Ferguson Jenkins and uh, George Castle, who wrote another book called mm -hmm. The 69 Cubs. Very good one. And uh, I had asked Fergie directly, like you had asked Kessinger, I go, could you have gone into him and say, hey, listen, I, you know, I don't feel like pitching today. He goes, you know what? He'd write that lineup up, and that was the lineup. You like it or not, you're playing, you know. And I remember a following year, one of the, a right fielder that was compared to the great Roberto Clemente, at times, not as good as Clement, was Johnny Callison. Mm -hmm. And even DeRocher De wore down a ball player like a Callison who came from Philadelphia, a star who was probably on his last legs in Chicago. But, you know, again, uh, like you said, a lot of the intangibles of what could happen and how things could spiral, it looks like definitely happened to that team. Um, the book came out in 06, uh, Miracle Collapse. Um, is it still, do you still see that there's a, a, a demand for it? Because this season, like you always say, is a season, like here you're getting this guy from Norwich, Illinois, and now living in Elk Grove, that still wants to talk about it. Why do you think that is, Doug? Why do we want to talk about the 69 Cubs more than we do sometimes of the 2016 team that won the World Series? I think it's a great question, John. I think it's just an emblematic Cubs season. You know, it, no. um, even by 1969, Cubs fans have been suffering for a long time. Oh yeah, <laughs> and this is finally it. Not only are we winning ball games, but we got the we got the team to, to sustain us through August and September or so it seemed. Um, 
and, and much I, that's another answer I'll give to that is I think the 69 Cubs uh, brought at least the north side of the city together or, and probably you could say the whole city you know how there's images of Willie Horton and the, you know the 68 Tigers and the 67 Tigers uh, 67 Tigers didn't win it but you know the image of Willie Horton standing on the car in the black neighborhoods and, yes. and other riot torn neighborhoods you know say urging people to come together and it was not maybe not to that degree, but I think I think the '69 Cubs became just such folk heroes with with the um, the bleacher bums coming about wearing their yellow construction helmets and then following the team on the road almost like deadheads. You know that's that's modern day stuff. You know where you talk about people you know making road trips to see a series in Atlanta. That's people didn't do that a whole lot back no, then. Not back then, right? But, right. Um, so they became they became kind of folk heroes. And again, I would say emblematic of of Cubs teams up until 2016, you know, the old, here we go again, you know, they'll, they'll find a way to blow it. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, DeRocher, the pressure, the screws really came on DeRocher, obviously in the middle of September there. And he reminded people that, Hey, you know, my 51 giants were um, down five games with eight to go. So we still have a chance, but then the Mets clinch, I think it was the 23rd yeah. of September. And, um, but this, John, I have, to, I have to share this before I forget. Um, the most compelling thing to me about that whole season, and um, this will add to my answer what you asked, you know, the Cubs were in first place for 155 days in 1969. Um, not 155 games on the schedule, but 155 days in the calendar. On the calendar. And for 149 of those, they're in first place by themselves. They're not even tied with anybody. And and that was the long, I don't know if it still is, but that was at least the longest stretch for any team to be in first place and not win a pennant. So, <laughs> you know, and I remember the only other collapse before that, I think was the 64 Phillies when the Cardinals Phillies. sure had like a four or five game lead. The Phillies had a four or five game lead and they just self-destructed themselves. Sure. When you... Go back to do you, besides Kessinger and the writers. Were there any other members of that team when you wrote that were still around in 2006 that you were able to reach out to, Doug? Uh, yes, Randy Hundley. I, 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 we didn't talk much, but um, Todd Hundley was a year older than me and we played against each other in Little League. Oh, uh, wow. Todd, Todd grew up in Palatine, uh, where the Hundleys live and uh, lived, yes. and I was in Algonquin and ran into some each other, some Little League tournaments, and I was a uh, um. I was a catcher back then, and my dad encouraged me. saw saw Randy sitting in a in a folding chair behind the, the stand behind the the uh, backstop, and encouraged me to go up and talk to him after after a little league game. And I did, and and then I reintroduced myself later. Um, but I think that's that's a neat thing about fandom too. Is you know you you uh, you circle back to uh, some of your favorites. Sure. As as an adult, that's neat. To, that's it's one of the pleasures I get as a is writing about sports is uh for instance i was living in south mississippi at the time i wrote this book um and don kessinger is retired in mississippi he lives in oxford mississippi and runs a real estate agency there with his wife and uh and I, that's when i approached him i said i'm just down the road and we got together and, and talked and i said you know isn't, isn't it fascinating that you know you being my favorite player 30 40 some odd wow. years ago and to be able to reconnect and sit down and talk about those days, you know what a treat for me, in addition to contributing to the book, he, um, what a, just a simple treat for me to to do that. So, um, yeah, they just said they just had that uh, appeal. I think Don Sel uh, Dick Selma, excuse me, Dick the, Selma. another pitcher from that team. Sure, um, he would, I guess, every game he would wave a towel and get the bleacher bums going. Sure. And, uh, so, <laughs> kind of ahead of their times in terms of you know the. Talk about the closeness people have today with players and teams through Twitter. Oh. People feel like they're, you know, they're right there with the players, every personal and professional move. And the 69 Cubs kind of immersed themselves in a community in kind of a pre-Twitter way, it seemed. Yeah, pre yeah, before the social media and the Google and everything else. You know, just saying what you just said about Don Kessinger, Doug, I mean, meeting him and the way you met him, God, you talk about, my parents always told me, you got to believe in the destiny. And that was a destiny that you met Kessinger to write this. I mean, this is a fantastic read. I mean, well, I, um, when I reached out to you, I says, geez, I would, now you're my Don Kessinger right now because I always wanted to meet you. And of course you've accomplished so much. And uh, 
But to depict the season the way you did for me was incredible. And, you know, there were stories in there that I, I didn't even know about. You know, we, I'll, there's a story in there that I knew about that you depicted. And I probably got the right thing is when it's after the 69 season. I think it's the 71 season. And we get a brash first baseman from New York named Joe Pepitone. <laughs> we'll talk about Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, they had a Billy Williams day and I think they had a Ferguson Jenkins day. And I think the rumor was that Sano asked for a day and uh, DeRocher of course was not, it was going, it was the beginning of the end for Leo. And I think he called out Milt Pappas and he called, and then Pepitone decides to say something that Ralph out, who was his manager in New York said he was stick by his players, not go after him. And, uh, you really got into that story. And that was, again, after that 69 season. But there you really start to see the unraveling. Uh, was that a hard story to find for you? Uh, yes. And again, um, uh, one I should say one reason I, uh, I go with secondhand research more than a lot of primary sources. In light of what I said earlier, it's fun and rewarding and beneficial to talk to the players but sure memories over time get skewed and um you know what was a really a, a one for four day was you know a, a four for five day in their mind yeah. so uh, um so uh, sticking to secondary sources uh is good but i will say uh and one of my cardinal I've, I've developed a friendship with jerry royce if you remember the, the sure the big lefty the lefty the, 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 yeah pitch sure. many years in big leagues and um, when one of my Cardinal books came out, he very politely and professionally, but but directly uh, got a hold of me and said, hey, some of these things you quoted from newspapers were not correct. I mean, I'd taken, I'd taken information from newspapers, but actually the newspaper writer had it wrong, which I was trusting. So sure. um, it's, um, you know, finding stories like that. It's, uh, it's all about vetting, you know, checking a source more than once, but um because there are rumors abound in professional oh. sports and and um so I, I i i don't print something unless i'm absolutely sure and even when i'm absolutely sure sometimes i found out i'm wrong so um that just as my, my writing career has evolved i try to be more and more careful about including sure. stories that uh, first of all do they have a purpose i mean if, if it don't have a purpose and it just um undermine somebody there's no reason to put it in yeah, but if it kind has... of like what what's what's the point of that right it, right it, exactly um when the book was finished in 2006 and it went to print uh somebody like a don kestinger of course who played on that team um uh, was he really happy the way you did that book i mean just from the athlete to the author he he, he was at least he told me he was and yes. um um, I found the right person to do the forward because not only is intimately involved every day of that season, of course, and with, sure. with every player and uh, an intelligent man and a gracious man, but um, also a very humble man. And I say this because uh, I've, I've approached Don about uh, writing a biography of his life and career. Oh, wow. And, and he doesn't want to do it because he is, he, he's, he told me, Doug, that usually involves, you know, defaming other people as you go through your story and I don't want to do that even inadvertently so um I, I just hold him in the highest regard uh, yes and, and um just I consider myself most fortunate to have um been able to track him down oh and, my god tremendous and, and, and Doug I gotta tell you I never met Kessinger of course saw him play matter of fact even saw him play on the south side when he became manager of the White Sox because I kind of strayed away from the North Siders after so many years of I didn't want to get into heavy drinking so I went to the south side now I'm drinking this summer but I have to tell you uh the, in the forward this really captured me from Kessinger when he writes the book is a personal journey allowing me to experience all over again the peaks and valleys of 1969 Doug has pre 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 uh, um, precisely captured the emotions of the lead National League for the most of the year and watching the lead sweep of in a painful September. What hurts the most is our failure to finish what we started for the great fans of the Chicago Cubs. That gives me goosebumps, Doug, because, you know, you wonder back in those days, of course, they're not making $1 million and a 210 hitter is not making $1 million like they are now. This man had to work after the season, I'm sure. And when you read something like that, I, I really felt like a Don Kessinger and probably 90% of that team 
wanted that more than anything for this great city. No, oh, their their hearts bled out. Uh, they gave everything they had. I mean, they're, they're, it's not like they left anything on the field, right? And then DeRocher included. I mean, I'm sure DeRocher was up nights, you know, wondering what he had to do to turn things around. But um, um, and and I and I think that's where you know the old school athlete uh, endears himself to the fan. Not that today's athletes don't, but um, there's a, there's just more of a more of a real world connection with people back then than um, yes, perhaps athletes have today. And I and I just think that respect factor, like you're saying, I got to tell you before we close it off because I you've been so gracious with your time and um, again you've written so many books. Uh, a view from two benches about Bob Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, Whitey builds a winner. Uh, Whitey Herzog, the great Whitey Herzog, I should say. Uh, Keith Magnus in the life and times of a, a beloved Chicago Blackhawk, which I have here also, and I'd like to get to that one day with you. And of course, uh, you wrote something about the St. Louis Cardinals, past and present. Gibson's last stand, who one of was I feel if I'm going to pick a top four pitcher, it's him, Koufax, and Seaver. And um, the near misses of the St. Louis Cardinals, the 1976 Cincinnati Reds, Alberto's 1967-68, and I'm sure we're talking about the 67 World Champion Cardinals and the 68 loss to the Tigers. Mm -hmm. And of course, the book Miracle Collapse, September Streak, the 1935 Cubs, which is something that I would like to get into myself. Again, a curriculum on, in the American Rural School Um Fleet of the Birds, the 1985 Cardinals, which you brought up here in the interview earlier today. And of course, Dizzy and the Gas House Gang, 1934, um, during that uh, depressionary kind of era. I don't know um, how to thank you. Um, I have to ask you, would yeah. you come back for another uh, interview? Because I would really like to talk to you, be being both from here from Illinois, I would really, really like to also talk to you about the book about Magnus in which... Again, another great read and how you depicted him. And of course, I read everything about that 1971 game when they won that, oh, could have won that Stanley Cup in 71 against Montreal. When I read just that chapter alone, it was bone chilling. I have to tell you, it was bone oh. chilling. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we talked earlier about, you know, the Lloyd Pettit um, oh. coming through on WMAQ. And um, uh, I just, uh, John, I'll say I love sports on the radio, still do. Oh, still yes. prefer listening to a game on the radio. And it seems whether it's hockey or baseball or football, you know, it's just that connection that um, the listener has with um, with radio and sports is where you paint it in your own mind. And, you know, Lloyd Pettit, Lloyd Pettit as you know, uh, Bob Elson and um, oh. Vince Lloyd, you know, all those guys from the past, uh, they knew how to do it. And uh, it's many good. We have a, a a young announcer here in Cincinnati, Tommy Thrall, who's taken okay. the place of Marty Brenneman on the Reds radio broadcast, and he's fantastic. So there are some, so some of those good connections from radio to radio from the old days. You know, you, you use the word here, and again, uh, you know, we had an announcer here in Chicago, Pat Foley, and of course, the great analyst, Pat Milchuk. Yeah. But I have to tell you, you use the word just now, which I think is missing. You use the word painted. And when I would listen to this old German stereo that my father had in the basement in Norwich, and, you know, I could still hear a Lloyd Pettit say, there's a face off to the left of Tony Esposito here on the way, you know, you felt like you were in the Chicago stadium, the way he depicted that game. And there was not a lot of this, you know, camaraderie, uh, jokes going on, side jokes and everything else, which... I guess now this is the rule of thumb. And I think I like the old announcing of a Jack Buck or a Jack Brickhouse because there wasn't a lot of an analyzation, meaning, okay, Gibson's going to slow uh, throw a slider right now to Ernie Banks. You didn't hear that. You know, it was just, here's the pitch to Banks, you know, strike three, Gibson struck him out. So, yeah, I guess it's that first impression. And that's how you got me on this book. Well, let's not forget the great Jim Durham with the Bulls, too. Yes. Uh, I I'd love um, being, you know, seven, eight, nine years old and have the Bulls playing, you know, Golden State or the Lakers somewhere on the West Coast. And my parents think I'd be long asleep. <laughs> and um, you know, Wilbur Holland hits one from the twilight zone. You know, Wilbur Holland with the old Bulls guard. Sure, 1977 team. Yeah. And uh, no, just those, um, uh, just it, it sticks with you. 
forever. Um, for sure. Uh, you know, these old city neighborhoods where you'd, you'd walk down the street and before we became a, I like to say we became a, a back porch society when we used to be a front porch society, you know, people would gather on their front porches. Now we gather on our back porches in more privacy, maybe for good reason. But, you know, you could walk down the street in Chicago and Cincinnati and St. Louis, and you'd never miss a pitch from the game because everyone would have the radio on. You just keep walking sure. and the game would be on in every house. And uh, that's that's something we certainly don't have anymore. We don't have anymore, right? Exactly. Now we just Google it and find out if they're winning or losing, I feel. <laughs> Doug, I truly want to thank you. And I I really would like to do yeah. a part two with you because this was a uh, really a special night sorry for the few little interruptions i had to move my spot uh there but uh we i wanted to get the connection right but I, this was truly uh a great time with you uh, today and uh hopefully we can do something in the fall and uh talk about some more other books and uh whatever you're doing and this was fantastic uh, i thoroughly enjoyed it john thank you again for having me on love to come back sometime you got it doug thank you again and uh we'll we definitely will talk soon very good. Thank you, John. Good night, sir.